watching online, make sure you get the right one. It is the 24th of October, 7 p.m. So if you're live streaming this one and I just said that, you know you got the right one. Glad to have you here again. I'm Ryan Council. Glad to have you again joining us for Understanding Revelation. Now, tonight is a very special day for me. This morning, I, at 9 o'clock, did something very special. Now, I see two little eyes and a blonde head in the back window waving at me. She knows the special. See, 27 years ago, at 9 o'clock, Eastern Standard Time, over in Yugoslavia, I married Maria. <laughs> So today we're celebrating our 27 years. So today in front of all her friends at 9 o'clock, I went over and I knelt down the proper way, you know, knelt down, took her hand and said, will you marry me for 27 more years? <laughs> and she said, yes, of course. And uh, so, honey, when we hit 54 years, I'll have to ask you for another 27. <laughs> If I make it that long. <laughs> but we're overjoyed to be happily married. And we're so glad that you're here tonight. I enjoyed so much last night. Learned it from the uh, Bible's prophecies and all the things. Um, I hope everybody was comfortable last night. And uh, we had a couple windows open. And we have the heat up. It feels comfortable. I'll try to make sure everybody um, has enough air flow. If you do feel hot or too cold or something, let me know. We want you to feel comfortable, but it's good to have you here tonight. I'm going to turn the time over to our uh, chair host tonight, Gary Knowlton. Thank you, Pastor Council. It's good to see each of you here tonight. And uh, just, a, just a comment before we uh, have our drawing and uh, get the meeting started tonight. I hope you enjoyed yourself uh, last night. And I hope you walked away knowing something that you didn't know before you came. And something even more poignant than there was 63 days until Christmas. <laughs> You know, this fall we're all aware that there are so many disturbing situations that are stirring around in this world. Uh, a world in which, although certainly not perfect, I felt once reasonably safe and secure. Through it all, though, I find hope and inspiration and blessing in God's holy word. I find no hope and inspiration and blessing in keeping track or mulling over the narrative that comes from the Infectious Disease Control Center or the debates, the presidential debates, or the United Nations, or even Fox News or CNN. Peace only returns to my heart when I set my sights on the only one that can do anything about our current world situation, and that's God. Amen. Only when safe in the arms of Jesus is it that I can really uh, relax and enjoy the moment and watch the beautiful fall leaves falling to the ground or watch the migrating waterfall as they go to their winter home. After all, you sit back and realize that each detail in life, of our lives, including the laws of science and this upcoming election, are all in the one, uh, all in the hands of the one who created all of us and the world. And the beauty of autumn. I can express it no better than the fireside poet William Cullen Bryant. And in his famous poem, To a Waterfowl, he says, He who from zone to zone guides through the boundless sky thy certain path, in the long way that I must tread alone, will lead my steps aright. God is in control. We know that. And yes, I think, I really think that's why you and I have followed our steps to this sanctuary tonight to learn more about God. And I'm so glad that you're here. 
I have the opportunity tonight uh, that uh, we have a drawing, and uh, I think I see the uh, uh, the slips coming up to me now. We're going to do it a little bit differently. I have two books tonight, or I have actually a DVD, uh, the Daniel Chronicles. It tells somewhat of the message that, that Michael had last night and even more. So you may want that one. And also a beautiful devotional, A World on Fire by David Metzger, Metzler. And I'm sure that uh, you would enjoy this book too. And what we're going to do is uh, to save some time, you're just going to pick them up on your way out. So don't forget, okay? Otherwise I might give it away to somebody else tomorrow night. Okay, I'm picking, how come I never can get a hold of these? <laughs> okay, I've got two, and I've got one from David and Rosella, no, Roslyn. N-O-R-M-S, Norms? Norms. There you go. Okay, make sure to pick one up. And I don't know which one you're going to get, but first one first. Uh, first one gets first serve, I guess. Alyssa, Alyssa Emmelander, too. And uh, has got, so don't forget you two to pick up your, uh, your gifts right at the greeter stand. There you go. At this time, uh, let us go ahead and have our, our prayer, and let's ask God to be with us as we meet together. Dear Father in heaven, thank you so much for this chance we have to open your word, and I pray through the power of the Holy Spirit, you impress upon these words in a meaningful way, and, and I pray, Lord, that uh, they might lodge in our brain and in our hearts to lead us to greater love and action for you. We long to be with you and uh, be released from the turmoils and trials of this earth to a place of perfect peace where we can be with our Creator, our Sustainer, and our Redeemer, Jesus Christ. To this end, I pray in his holy name. Amen. Our special music tonight is brought to us by Tammy Hasty.
Good evening. Good evening. Um, this is the second night, and last night, um, I neglected to do something, and so I'd like my wife and my granddaughter to come up here for a minute. Come on up. Come on. Come on up. Yep, I'm going to put you on the spot. Come on, Alani. <laughs> When you got the brochures, when we sent them out in the mail, there was a picture of two people in the brochures. Yes. One was myself as a speaker, but the other one was my better half. And that's my wife. Take your mask off. <laughs> we live in the same house. And uh, this is Marcella. And we've been married for about almost 29 years now. And we had three children, Malachi, Micah, and Melody. And Melody means a sweet song. And uh, we have our little granddaughter here, Eleni, and she's five, almost to be six years old. And you see I, Asher's father back there, Eleni? Wave to him. <laughs> now you're waving to everybody online, too, okay? Thank you for coming up. And I appreciate the support that I have from my wife um, and my children. Okay. All right, now we can get started, all right? <clears throat> okay, questions. Somebody asked me, you mentioned that Jesus said, I have told us things before they come to pass, that when they come to pass, you might believe that I am he. Now, the he is added in italics on, in the, new, uh, the King James Version. I am means God. <clears throat> so the person asked me, do you believe that Jesus is God? Well, first of all, it doesn't matter what I believe anyway, does it? And it doesn't matter what you believe. It, believe. it matters what the Bible teaches rightly understood. And so some churches believe that Jesus was a great prophet. That's it. Some believe he was an angel exalted to God in the past. Others believe that he was created or emerged from the Father in the long lost past. But what does Revelation and the rest of the Bible reveal about Jesus? Was he God? Was he the Son of God? Was he an angel? Was he a prophet? Was he a good man or a deluded deceiver? You ask what I believe, I believe what the Bible says rightly understood. Jehovah said in Isaiah 44, 6, uh, you could say this name for God is Jehovah or Yahweh, your, your choice, your preference. Uh, Jehovah from, comes from the Greek, and Yahweh comes from the Hebrew. But Jehovah says... God. Jesus says in Revelation, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead, and none. I'm alive forevermore. So Jesus claimed to be the first and the last. So what was Jesus saying? I am God. I am Jehovah. Jehovah said that he was a savior in Isaiah 43, 11, And beside me there is what? No savior. So who's the only one that can save us? Jehovah. And yet, in Matthew 1, 21, it talks about Jesus, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Now, the name Jesus Christ is more of a title than it is a name. Yeshua, Mashiach, is his name in Hebrew. Jesus means God our Savior, or God saves. Christ means the chosen one, or the anointed one. So Jesus' name means God our Savior, the chosen one. He is Emmanuel, which means God with us. David said in the Psalms that Jehovah was his shepherd. Remember Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Well, Jesus stated in John 10 that he was a good shepherd. 
Jehovah said he was the creator, and yet in the scriptures, Jesus is referred to as the creator. John chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then verse 10 says, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. He was in the world, and the world was made by him. Excuse me, verse 10, verse 14. You know, that the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. That's talking about Jesus. In the beginning was Jesus, and Jesus was with God, and Jesus was God. Now, in another Bible, from another church, they put the word A in there. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was a God, trying to make Jesus some kind of secondary God. That is wrong. It's a mistranslation and misleading. Galatians 1.16 says Jesus created all things. Hebrews 1.1. 1, 1. Hebrews 1.1. 1, 1. Let's go there. Hebrews 1.1. 1, 1. That's a big Bible. Large print. <laughs> All right, Hebrews 1.1, 1, 1. God, who at sundry times and diverse manners spoke in times past unto the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. So God made the worlds through Jesus. Who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person. Micah prophesied that the one to be born in Bethlehem, to be ruler in Israel, has existed from everlasting. Now, what does everlasting mean? He's always existed. In Hebrews verse one, uh, chapter 1, which we just, verse, just read part of, verse 8, it says, Unto the Son, he saith, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. Unto the Son, he said, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. Jesus is God. The Bible also states that no angel has ever been called the Son of God. That's in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 5. And I want to make that clear because a lot of people get confused about a lot of things if they don't understand the Bible very well. And this whole world has been confused. Hebrews chapter 1. Verse 5, for under which of the angels said he at any time, you are my son? What's the answer? Never. God has never called an angel his son. Angels are ministering spirits, it says in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 14. Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister to them who shall be heirs of salvation? That's us. We are called the sons of God, and angels minister to and for us to help us. Hebrews 1.5 says that God never called any of his angels a son, so Jesus is not an exalted angel. Also, this shows that when people die, they don't become angels either. Why would you want to go from being a son of God to an angel who is not a son of God? When you die, when you're resurrected, you become a son of God throughout eternity. Luke 3, 38, Adam is called the son of God. 1 John 3, 1, John says that we are called the sons of God when we accept Jesus as our personal Savior, our Lord and Master. So when Cain killed Abel, then Seth was born, and his children began to call upon the name of the Lord, according to Genesis. And when their children began to call upon the name of the Lord, they would be called what? The sons and daughters of God. And they saw Cain's descendants, which are the daughters of men, and they intermarried. This idea... That angels had sex with human beings is a bizarre one, but it's popular even in Christian churches. The sons of God saw the daughters of men and that they were fair. That's Seth's children seeing Cain's children. They intermarried. They got so wicked, God had to destroy the earth because when you marry somebody outside the church, compromise takes place. And then you're not being faithful anymore. Angels are never called sons of God. We are the sons of God, so we are in a different category than angels. 
Angels existed before man was created. Paul states in a letter to the Corinthians that Jesus was the God that led Israel out of Egypt. 1 Corinthians 10, 1 and 4. Moreover, brethren, I would not have you to be ignorant that they all followed that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 1 through 4. It was Jesus Christ was the God that led the children of Israel out of Egypt. It was Jesus Christ who parted the waters so they could march through the Red Sea. Jesus said that he was one with the Father in the express image of the Father. Why is this so important? John 10, 30, I and my Father are what? One. John 14, 8, Philip said unto him, Lord, show us the Father, and it will suffice us. Jesus said unto him, Have I not been so long with you, and you do not know what? Me. Show us the Father. I am the Father. He who has seen me has seen the Father. Why am I stressing this so much? Revelation reveals who Jesus is, and Jesus has said it's very important to understand who he is because of what he has done. Jesus, said, Jesus stated in John 5, 37, you have neither heard his voice, who's he talking about? The Father. At any time, neither have you seen his shape. No man has seen God at any time. No man, John 1, 18, has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he has declared him. So who walked with Adam and Eve in the garden? Jesus Christ. Who thundered the Ten Commandments down from mountain and Moses saw his back parts? Jesus Christ. Who was in the fiery furnace with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Jesus. Jesus. Who led Israel out of Egypt according to 1 Corinthians chapter 10? Jesus. Isaiah 9, 6 said this, For unto us a what is born? A child. Unto us a son is given. And his name, the son's name, the child's name, shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Prince of Peace. And we know that's Jesus. Oh, wait a minute. I skipped two. The Mighty God, the Everlasting what? Father. Because Jesus is the only Father we've ever seen or heard. There is a Father in heaven. But we haven't seen him. Jesus said he was from above. He said, you are from beneath, John 8, 23, 24, and I am from above, you are of this world, I am what? Not of this world. Now, this guy is either the craziest person you've ever run into, or he is what he said he was. I say, therefore, unto you, that you shall die in your sins, for if you do not believe that I am he, you shall die in your sins. Wow. Wow. Why so harsh? If you don't believe Jesus is God, you're going to die in your sins. Why so harsh? Because the only one that could save us from our sins is God himself. If Jesus is not Jehovah, then he's not the Savior, for only God can save us. Only the one who made us could die to save everyone. So to call Jesus a good man, which he was, a prophet, which he was, the son, which he was, but not God or an exalted angel is to deny that Jesus is who he claimed to be and leads us to be lost in our sins. Is that important? Amen. That's what Bible says. That's not what I believe. I believe it because it's in the Bible, but that's not just my opinion versus your opinion. I had some people come to my house one time and they told me they tried to give me a pamphlet to invite them to some of their meetings or a meeting they have once a year. And I said, well, isn't it interesting? And then I mentioned that quote that Jesus made. And they says, well, you have your opinion and we have ours. It's not my opinion. It's a quote from Jesus' own words. And it's important. Now, is there only one God? Is there a trinity mentioned in the Bible, Mark 1.10? When Jesus was baptized by John, where was he? He was in the water. Who spoke from heaven? God the Father. Who is in the, between heaven and earth in the form of a dove? Holy Spirit. You see all three entities in three different places at the same time. 
In Deuteronomy, it states that God is one. The Hebrew Shema says, Hear, O Lord Israel, our Lord God is one Lord. Well, the word, the word for Lord is Yahweh or Jehovah, and God is Elohim, notice that, and one is Echad in the Hebrew. <clears throat> Elohim, the word for God is plural. The I am is like cherub and cherubim. Those are uh, plural endings. Cherub means one angel. Cherubim means many angels. Seraph, one angel. Seraphim, many angels. Eloha, one God. Elohim, plural. Adonai and El Shaddai, no other names for God. The A-I ending is also in the plural ending. Echad, the word for one, is the plural one. As in the people spoke with one voice. Everybody speaking at once or everybody singing at once sounds like what? One voice. Is it one singular? No, it's the plural one. Or the family unit is of one mind. Myself, my wife, my three children are all called frackers. We're all frackers, but we're not the same person. We have a unity of one mind. Let us make man in our image. Were we made in the image of angels or in the image of God? We're made in the image of God. So God said, let us, which is a plural, make men in our, which is what? A plural, image. Well, what about the Holy Spirit? Well, he bears witness. He's part of the Trinity. In John 14, Jesus said the Spirit testifies of Christ. Christ glorified the Father. The Father spoke of Christ as beloved Son. When he left, he would send the Spirit. Why? Because when he left, he left with a human body. He came down here as a human being, was born in the flesh as a human being, and when he died, he died as a human being. And when he was risen, he was glorified, but he still had a human body. How do I know that? Think. He showed up. Doubting Thomas said, I don't think he's arisen. He said, Thomas, come over here. Put your fists in the holes in my hands. Put your fists in the hole in my side and see that it is I. Because a spirit doesn't have flesh and bone as you see me have. How clear can it be? Jesus is 100% man and 100% God. Now, I don't know about percentages, but that doesn't work out for anything else, but it does work out for God. He said the Spirit would glorify Christ, but not glorify himself. If the Holy Spirit is only the Spirit of Christ, how could he glorify Christ and not himself? First John says there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. That's in the Bible. We were told to go and baptize in the name of the Father, and in the name of the Son, and in the name of the Holy Spirit. Why? You know, the devil's got a false trinity in the Bible, in Revelation. The beast, the dragon, and the false prophet. Why would he counterfeit a trinity if there wasn't one? Jesus needs to be accepted as God because only God is our Savior. Only God can forgive us. Only God could die for us. And he did as a human, overcoming and condemning sin in the flesh. We are not Mormon. We are not Jehovah Witnesses. We are not Muslims because we believe that Jesus is part of a trinity and is God manifested in the flesh. I hope I answered that question. Amen? Amen. 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 Tonight we want to look at our place in history. Keep those questions coming. The chapters of Revelation. The hero of the book is introduced. Two and three, the war in the seven churches. Through a horn five, opening a mysteriously sealed book. Chapter 6 and 7, War of the Seven Seals. There's war all the way through Revelation. Chapter 8 and 9, War of the Seven Trumpets. Chapter 10, Eating a Bittersweet Book. Chapter 11, War of the Two Witnesses. Chapter 12, War on the Woman. Chapter 13, The Beast Mark of War. Chapter 14, The Three Angels' Messages. Chapter 15 and 16, God's Wrath in the War, The Seven Last Plagues. Chapter 17 and 18, Babylon and Her War on God's People. 
Chapter 19, the White Horse Hero of War. Chapter 20, the Thousand Years of No War. Chapter 21 and 22, Peace in Heaven, Peace on Earth. The whole book of Revelation goes through war, but at the end, Christ wins. Amen? There are contrasts in Revelation to show that there is truth and there is falsehood in the world. There are two cities, two trinities, two armies, two women, two fires, two sanctuaries, two priesthoods, two seals, two witnesses, two books, two harvests, two doors, two harvests, and two beasts. For example, the two women, one is pure, one is a prostitute. One is clothed in white, the other is scarlet and purple. One is persecuted, one is a persecutor. Contrasts, good and evil. Revelation covers a great controversy between, between the powers of good, Christ and his kingdom, against the powers of evil, Satan and his kingdom. It shows how the battle has played itself out here on earth and how it has affected the people on earth throughout the ages of Christian history. It reveals truth and exposes falsehood. Well, I didn't give you a chance to read it. <laughs> revelation is a revealing or unveiling, especially of the future. A revelation is an insight and understanding, a prediction of what's to happen before it happens. It is not, as some would say, a closed book. It is God's symbolic message to his church to warn and encourage his people concerning the future. Revelation reveals war, not only the reality of human warfare, but also the spiritual war that goes on over every human being that lives on the earth. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against the wicked spirits in high places. Revelation reveals war in heaven, War in the seven churches, war in the seven seals, war in the seven trumpets, war in the seven plagues, and war in the seven time prophecies. And we're going to cover every one of these things in this series of meetings. The revelation concerning God's love letter to me. Revelation letter. Of 404 verses in Revelation, 278 are borrowed from or quotes from the Old Testament. The prophets have always used symbols to convey the divine message. In the Apocalypse, symbolism becomes a main stock and trade, particularly as a technique for outlining the course of history without employing historical names. This technique occurs first in the book of Daniel, and that's why we covered Daniel 2, 7, and 11 last night. That's from the Evangelical Dictionary of Theology, Walter Elwell, page 63, 1987, Baker Bookhouse. The book of Revelation was written by John, who was called the Beloved Disciple. John was with Jesus when Jesus was baptized and when Jesus was crucified. John was considered to be one of Jesus' closest friends. John was one of the leaders of the early Christian church. John was placed in a pot of boiling oil for being a Christian, but God preserved him and it did him no harm. As an old man, he received a revelation from God, which we now call the Apocalypse, or the book of Revelation. John wrote this book while he was a prisoner on the island of Patmos. After they boiled him in oil and it didn't do anything to him, they put him on an island so he couldn't talk to anybody and spread the gospel. The tiny creek island on the coast of Turkey. John was banished there because of his faith in Jesus and his enemies' attempts to kill him had failed. John wrote Revelation when he was about 84 years old. Revelation begins a book with a revelation of Jesus Christ. And they help us understand God's plans for our planet. Chapter 1 reveals Jesus, that it is from Jesus, that he's a returning Savior. Revelation 1, 7 and 22, 20. And that he is the eternal God, Revelation 1, 8 and 22, 13. It also reveals Jesus as our high priest standing among the candlesticks in the holy place of the heavenly temple, Revelation 1, 12 and 13. What happens to those who wrote the New Testament scriptures? John the Baptist was cut, had his head cut off. Jesus Christ was scourged and crucified. Stephen was stoned. James was beheaded by Herod Agrippa. Philip was scourged and crucified. Matthew was killed with a halberd. James was stoned and clubbed in the head. 
Matthias was stoned and beheaded in Jerusalem. Andrew was crucified at Edessa. Mark was dragged to pieces in Alexandria by wild horses. Jude Thaddeus was crucified in Edessa. Paul was beheaded at Rome. Bartholomew was beaten and crucified. Peter was crucified upside down because he didn't want to be crucified like Jesus. Thomas was speared at Parthia. Luke was hanged on a tree in Greece. Simon Zelotes was crucified in Britain. And John was banished to the island of Patmos. So you might say John was the only survivor. Revelation reveals Jesus' personality, his power, his ministry, and his eternal purpose. His name or equivalent is used 187 times in the first three chapters of the book of Revelation. It really is a revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, most people would agree that we could be living on the edge of eternity, but when will that be? Over the years, there have been a lot of false predictions made. Can we be led to believe the end is near? 40% of Americans believe in the Bible prediction of the end of the world. The Bible says that when Jesus comes, there will be no more death, no more sorrow, no more crying, no more tears, no more pain. Man, I like to hear the sound of that. When the Bible talks about the end, it's discussing something positive. Because the end of the world is connected to the return of Jesus. So today we can look forward with hope, looking for a time when there is no more hardship, difficulties, or challenges we so often face. If Jesus is going to return to this earth, this will be the greatest event since the creation. The second coming of Jesus has given people hope. In the book of Job, the first book of the Bible to be written, Job said in Job 19, 25 and 26, For I know that my Redeemer lives, and he shall stand at the last on the earth, and after my skin is destroyed, this know that in my flesh I shall see God. Now, this is way back a long time ago. This is the first book written by Moses, the book of Job. And way back then, maybe 4,000 years ago, maybe 6,000 years ago, Job says, Jesus lives, and he's coming back. Can you imagine that? Whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold, and not another. He's not going to be transformed into somebody else. It's still him. How my heart yearns within me. He's looking forward to the second coming. Job asked the question that so many people ask. If a man dies, shall he live again? All the days of my hard service I will wait until my change comes. Then he adds, you shall call, and I will answer you. And that's when the change takes place. And we're going to cover that in another lesson. Isaiah prophesied about the second coming. Isaiah, way back in the Old Testament again, 2,500 years ago. Thy dead men shall live, together with my dead body shall they arise. Awake and sing, you that dwell in the dust, and the earth shall cast out the dead. Has that happened yet? No, but it's going to happen. Caiaphas okay, asked Jesus, Are you the Christ, the Son of the blessed? And Jesus replied, I am. And you shall see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. And then Revelation chapter 1, verse 7, said, Behold, he comes with the clouds. And every eye shall see him. The return of Jesus Christ holds out hope for a new life, and the book of Revelation offers that hope. You see, the great hope of the Christian world is not in dying. It's in a resurrection of the dead at the last day. Look what Jesus said 2,000 years ago in Matthew chapter 24. The disciples asked him a question, What will be the sign of your coming of the end of the age, or the end of the world? Jesus had just told them the temple in Jerusalem was going to be destroyed, which in their mind meant the end of the world. If the temple is going to be destroyed, it must be the end. And in response to their question, Jesus gave them a number of signs by which they and we could know the end was near. He had made it clear that no one could know the day or the hour of his return, but he did say we can know when it's near by the signs. As we study the Bible, understanding must be guided by God himself. 2 Timothy 3.16 says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of who? Of God. We can respect our friends or our ministers or our teachers, but the final word on the Bible comes from God who inspired us writing. Holy men of God were moved by the Holy Spirit to write what they did. 
So we can't doubt what they wrote. We want to twist it and turn it, like Peter said some of Paul's writings are. The disciple asked Jesus about his return and about the end of the world, and in response, Jesus said this in Matthew 24, 6. You will hear of wars and rumors or news of wars. In the last century, more people have died in warfare than in the previous 2,000 years. Last century means the last 100 years. In World War I, the war to end all wars, it was called. 24 million people died. In World War II, 60 million people died. Since then, there's been the Korean War, the Vietnam War, the Gulf War, and Afghanistan. For us, who can forget the devilish attempt of extermination of millions of Jews at the German death camps in the carnage of war? There have been wars across Africa and Europe. There have been conflicts and uprisings in many countries around the world, with the Middle East being especially affected. We have had the Korean War, the war in Vietnam, Iran and Iraq, Indochina, Bosnia, and many tribal wars in Africa, including the Hutus and the Tutsis, where brothers and sisters and fathers and mothers and children were killing each other because they belonged to a different tribe. The 20th century was the bloodiest in all of the history of mankind. Just a short time ago, we had the bombing in Paris by ISIS extremists, and then the bombing in Belgium in retaliation because Belgium had captured the mastermind of the Paris attacks. Certainly, war has become a fact of everyday living for millions around the world. This world is a ticking time bomb, and it's being blown apart one section at a time in many places around the world. The Paris bombing in 2019 left multitudes dead and property destroyed. ISIS, Boko Haram, Taliban, and many more groups are rising to terrorize the world. Then in Matthew 24, 7, Jesus said that we would see famines and pestilences and earthquakes in different places. In the last decade, there have been a dozen or more famines and food crises affecting millions of people. There are almost a billion hungry people in the world today. About one in seven people don't get adequate food. One child dies every five seconds from hunger-related causes. In 2008, almost 3 million children died before their fifth birthday due to hunger and malnourishment. This is a colossal tragedy. About 57 million people die each year due to famine. That's 156,000 people every day. The average American weighs 220 pounds of food each year. A third of all the food produced in the world gets lost or wasted. And yet we've got one billion people who are hungry and people starving every day. Then Jesus mentioned pestilences, diseases, and epidemics. Two million people die every year because of AIDS. Oh yeah, it didn't go away. They just don't report it anymore. That's one person every 15 seconds. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention of the CDC in Atlanta, Georgia, says there are currently 1.2 million Americans living with AIDS. 40 million people worldwide are living with the AIDS HIV virus. In the year 2003, 5 million people got HIV and 3 million people died of AIDS. And now we have the COVID-19 pandemic. There is something different about this one though. What is different about this one is people's reaction to it. And that reaction is fear. And that fear led to government control of individual rights and a change to how we live and interact in society, even how and when we can go to church, leave our homes, or even socialize with each other. Jesus stated in Luke 21 that men's hearts will be failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming upon the earth, for the powers of heaven will be shaken. Men's hearts failing them for fear. What does that ind indicate? Heart attacks. The CDC says 27 million Americans have been diagnosed with heart disease, and there are many more undiagnosed. Many people find out they have heart disease when they have a heart attack and die. 26 million Americans suffer from diabetes, and there are 79 million pre-diabetics, and the number is going up. We don't see these as plagues because it's so common for someone to have heart disease and diabetes, but that's exactly what it is. Everyone knows someone with diabetes or cancer. When I was in Russia and Ukraine, the Ukrainians joked. They said, we got the only vegetables that glow in the dark, but they have to eat them anyway. They'll starve. Every family I met 
in Russia and Ukraine had someone in their family who had died from cancer. One and a half million new cancer cases each year in America. Over half a million people die of cancer every year in this country. A few years ago, I was diagnosed with melanoma, skin cancer. They cut it out. Luckily, it hasn't come back. A few years ago, my 27-year-old son was fighting Hodgkin's lymphoma. He went through chemotherapy, and it's been gone for about five years now. And then we can start talking about the scary diseases, COVID-19, SARS, Ebola, mad cow disease, swine flu, bird flu. We have Zika, which affects newborns. These are new diseases, but even some of the old ones are making a comeback. Tuberculosis claims 2 million lives a year around the world after we thought we had it beat. Matthew 24, 7 says, and there shall be earthquakes in different places. A massive earthquake in Japan moved an island six feet and killed 15,000 people. We remember the pictures of the tsunami as water rushed in and swept people away and caused a nuclear disaster. There have been recent devastating earthquakes in Iran, Chile, New Zealand, and Indonesia. In 2004, one earthquake caused a tsunami in which 230,000 people died. Nobody had ever seen anything like that before. Last year in California, we saw roads buckled and destroyed by earthquake. High-rise buildings in Mexico City, in Indonesia, in France, and many cities around the world have been demolished by earthquakes. After that, Pakistan, 80,000 people dead in 2005. China, 70,000 people dead in 2008. Haiti, 222,000 people dead in 2010. And then we have two major earthquakes in Mexico City recently. Earthquakes are now an everyday occurrence. There are 35 earthquakes a day around the world. That's between 12 and 14,000 earthquakes every year. Jesus goes on in Luke and says there will be distress of nations with perplexity. What does that mean? Distress of nations with perplexity. That means trouble between nations with no way out, no problem solving, no way to fix it. So countries make peace treaties, pacts, have councils and meetings, and yet there are no solutions and no way out. Everybody talks peace, but there is no peace. And then it says the seas and the waves roaring. In the United States, two hurricanes, Rita and Katrina, caused $150 billion worth of damages and terrible loss of life. Nobody had ever seen anything like that before. Monsoons, tidal waves, typhoons, tsunamis, flooding are devastating the world like never before. Not too long ago, Hurricane Harvey hit Texas like no other had done before. Irma hit Florida, Maria hit Puerto Rico, and left people there looking at years for recovery. Hurricane Dorian hit the Bahamas and devastated the whole island country. The same hurricane hit North Carolina in 2019. This is Hurricane Dorian in 2019. In my wife's own time in the Philippines, a few years ago, her relatives and neighbors were hit by three consecutive typhoons in less than a month in the same area. Houses and crops were washed away, but the church we built there in San Vicente was still standing and was used as an emergency center to pass out food and clothing. Praise the Lord. Recently in the Amazon basin, two droughts that usually occur every 100 years or so happened within five years. Half a million people were evacuated from along the Yangtze River in China. Jesus said you can expect these things shortly before he returns. The disciples asked, what will be the sign of your coming at the end of the world? In Matthew 24, 37, Jesus said, as the days of Noah were, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. What was it like in Noah's day? Genesis 6, 5 tells us the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Wow. Whether it's cartels in Mexico, terrorists in the Middle East, or criminals in our own neighborhoods, it seems like people have dedicated their lives to perfecting the art of evil and sin. That's what it was like in the days of Noah. The earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. Genesis 6, 11. Does this sound like the day in which we are living? There is a description of what it would be like in the last days just before Jesus returns. 1 Timothy 3 says, This know also that in the last days, now what days? Last days. Perilous times shall come. That means dangerous times. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, 
greedy, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents. Do we have disobedience to parents today? Unthankful, unholy, without natural affection. You know, parents kill their children and throw them in garbage cans. Children kill their parents because they won't let them see a certain boy or have an iPod or something. Truce breakers make a promise and then break it. False accusers, incontinent, can't control themselves. Fierce, despises of those that are good. Traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. They live like the devil and claim to be Christian. Having a form of godliness, but denying the power. The power is in a changed life to become like Christ, to overcome sin, and to love people, not hate them, not steal from them, not rape them, not kill them. We find babies in trash cans, people robbed and shopped and left in alleyways, children killing their parents, and there's no natural affection. Robberies in broad daylight, car theft, manipulators by computer operators to steal people's money, their credit cards, and their personal information. Abortions of the unborn are normal and done by the thousands every year. So we see babies left in trash cans, teens and killing and disrespecting their parents over curfews, boyfriends and rules, rioting in the streets, daylight robberies, murders over shoes and jewelry, rapes and thefts, protests turned into riots as people loot, steal and burn their way through city streets, anti-law, anti-government, no self-control. 10 million violent crimes are committed per year in the United States, a supposedly Christian nation. What happened? What happened to us? 15 people died in the tragic shoot school shooting. And like that before. We wondered how it could possibly get worse. In 2007, a gunman on the campus of a university in Virginia killed 33 people, and now experts say we have a major school shooting every two months. Shootings in Florida, Las Vegas, and Texas, 2013 in a Florida nightclub shooting. This is a map of 101 mass school shooting locations in 2018, two years ago, in the United States. Surely something has gone wrong in our society. Bombings in Boston, ISIS, Al-Qaeda, Boko Haram. Then there were the shootings in Norway, the bombings in Boston. These horrible acts are filling the news. In 2016, a driver randomly killed six people in different locations in Kalamazoo, Michigan. Is this earth filled with violence? Every time you go through an airport, you're reminded that we're living in a world that has been changed and we're never going back to the way things used to be. And still, there seem to be some who are willing to push the world to the brink of destruction. North Korea's leader is practicing from nuclear missiles to be sent out against its perceived enemies. Iran has nuclear weapons of mass destruction. And I just found out recently that Russia had a super killer missile that can travel for days with a small nuclear engine under radar detection. But it blew up at their launch facility and caused nuclear fallout that we discovered by satellite images. So before they could blow us up, it blew up on their launch pad. As we have Iran and their anti-American rhetoric and mission to destroy the United States and Israel. Now some might say it's always been like this. There's always been earthquakes and famines. The world has been violent since Cain killed Abel. When he says sorrows, that word that he uses means birth pains, the beginning of birth pains. And ladies, if you've had a child, you know what we're talking about. As the birth of the baby gets nearer, the contractions become more and more frequent and more and more intense. Jesus said the signs of his coming are like those birth pains. Do we see these things becoming more and more frequent and more and more intense? Could it be that the earthquakes and the wars and rumors of wars and the famines and pestilences have become more frequent and more intense? There's no question. 
Jesus said in Luke 21, 28, that when you see these things begin to happen, then look up and lift up your head because your redemption draws nigh. In spite of the severity of what is happening in our world, Jesus says it's a time for hope because His coming is near, even at the doors. If we are seeing the signs of the times, we have evidence that Jesus is coming back soon. This is a time for hope for you and me. Because one day soon, the sin in this world is going to be gone. No more pain, no more temptation, no more death. Crime will be no more. Jesus said, take heed that no one deceives you. Many will come in my name and they will say that I am the Christ and they will deceive many. And we've seen that in recent years. Jim Jones led 900 people to their deaths in South America in the name of God. And yet he had been a respected member of society with endorsements from people in very high places. David Koresh said, I am the Lamb. There are cult leaders and false teachers, but there's no need for people to be deceived. Revelation 11, verse 18, says that Jesus would come to destroy those who would destroy the earth. For thousands of years, man has not had the ability to destroy the earth. Now we have nuclear weapons, even in the hands of irresponsible nations and people, and man-made chemicals and inventions that can destroy the earth intentionally or not. Our world is being destroyed piece by piece. The signs are being fulfilled before our eyes. False Christs and prophets, wars and numerous of wars, cries of peace but no peace, famines, diseases, earthquakes, sexual immorality, homes falling apart, violence everywhere. People are angry. Matthew 24, 21 states that there will be a great tribulation such as we have never seen before or will see again. If you put your faith in God and the Word of God, you will be on solid ground. I want to encourage you in this seminar to pray and to read the Bible. Follow God's leading and He will make things clear. The Word of God will give you hope even as the world spins out of control. There is power in God's Word. There is power in His promises. We can put our faith and trust in Jesus today. He is coming back soon. That's what the message of the Bible says, and God offers everlasting life to all who will accept it. Paul testified openly of his faith and belief in the second coming and the resurrection when Jesus returns. He stated, I am a Pharisee and the son of a Pharisee. Of the hope and resurrection of the dead, I am called in question. He believed in the resurrection. The second coming of Jesus is the blessed hope for Christians around the world in all ages because it brings about the resurrection in a new age with no more crying, tears, sorrow, or death. For the former things are passed away. The rock will come and smite the image on the feet of iron and clay. That's Jesus coming back to destroy all these kingdoms. Titus 2.13 states, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our God. map that God has given us, the map of the Holy Bible, you're going to be safe. If you will follow the Holy Bible in earth's final days, you'll be on solid ground. The signs around us that tell us that these are important Jesus to return. Raise your hand with me if you want to be ready. Amen. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, thank you that we can live in an exciting time in earth's history and lean on the promises of your word. Though the signs are fulfilling, we are grateful that we can know our redemption draws near. We thank you for Jesus, the true rock. Keep us close to him always, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. If you have any questions, please write them down and leave them in the basket in the foyer, and I'll try to answer them the following night. Those watching can email me at mfracker at charter.net. And I pray that you have safe travel back home. The Lord will bless you and guide you and lead you. Amen.